I'm going to go right back to uh, Tech Shop. And um, I was in uh, Detroit uh, last weekend for the opening of uh, Tech Shop there. And it's just like Mark says. Uh, everybody is really excited about what's going on and what Tech Shop has to offer them. And the interesting thing about Detroit is it's sort of the test ground for all of these new things that you've been hearing about in terms of the new industrial revolution. And I don't like the word industrial either. But um, it, when you talk to the people um, going through Tech Shop in Detroit, the interesting thing they have to tell you is that they recognize and appreciate that they're at the crossroads, the crossroads between an old economy of manufacturing and something new, something they aren't sure exactly what's going to be. But they know in Detroit um, that the old manufacturing is out, and they're beginning to look for something new. So tech shops themselves, tech shops, hacker spaces, fab labs, uh, operations like that are at another kind of crossroads of two important phenomena that are going on right now. The first of which uh, you've been hearing about, the DIY, the new DIY movement, the maker movement. Um, I think this is something that's really important. And it's important because it's about the way we physically interact with things in the world, the way we make things, the way we manipulate things, the way we handle things, because our human intellect, the way our cognition works, all depends on our having modeled the physical world. We learn, we develop, we think, we become creative, and we innovate because of the way in which we interact with objects as we grow and mature. There are those who even argue that our language has evolved from our tool use, and specifically from our collaboration over tool use, and our having to share with each other how tools actually work. I think this is an incredibly important thing. And the maker movement is really um, in the vanguard of kind of calling all of our attention to the importance of this physical interaction for our own creativity, for our kids' education, um, and particularly the importance of the fact that we actually learn by making things. We enter the importance of interacting physically with things as we develop. It's hard to overemphasize. But um, that's not what I want to talk about today, as important as I think it is. It's this other phenomena that also shows up in the interaction in hacker spaces, and that's um, digital fabrication. Digital fabrication is kind of the new way of making things, a new way of way making things that starts with the, the idea, the concept we have, and now moves to a digital model. A digital model that can be sent to a digital tool and from which we can produce real physical objects um, that we use in our environment. And this new process that links uh, extremely well the, the model and the machine gives us amazing new capabilities in terms of shaping, making, and creating things that allow just about anybody to do things with precision and high fidelity and re reproducibility that you couldn't do um, in days gone by. And it's really made possible by the digital model itself, which because of software um, and the web, it's something that we can communicate, we can share, we can modify, and we can collaborate over. Um, it's an important new process that really represents the coming together of uh, a lot of technologies. We think about digital fabrication in terms of uh, additive digital fabrication, subtractive digital fabrication, assembly, the same kinds of things that Carl Bass mentioned earlier this morning. Everybody is aware of sort of the excitement over the additive digital fabrication. Um, 3D printers have gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, more specifically subtractive digital fabrication. Think of it as subtractive 3D printing, if you would like. We're talking about CNC tools, CNC routers, CNC mills, CNC, uh, lasers, water jet cutting, and so on. These are tools that are capable of incredibly precise and uh, extremely high quality 
uh, cutting, drilling, machining, and carving. They were once the province of industry. And in fact, in many ways, they have a bad name because as soon as you mention CNC to most people, they think of automation making 100,000 or 10,000 of something. And it, it sort of belies the fact that over the last 10 years, in conjunction with uh, the personal computer, these tools have been, become much more flexible, much more agile, and much more accessible to just about everybody. And that's, in a sense, the core of, uh, of what I think is really exciting. The methodology for digital, for subtractive digital fabrication tools has evolved over 80 years. They're, they're tools that are highly honed. We understand well how the motors need to work, how the spindles need to work, how the cutters need to work, and those sorts of things. They've been optimized and proven in, in industry. And there are standards for it that make these tools, as they come into everybody's hands, through the usability that the personal computer gives to the front end of the tool, makes them uh, incredibly more useful. And useful in a way that's now affordable and oriented to individuals. I like to think of it as sort of the difference between mainframe and PCs. Up until 10 years ago, CNC tools, water jets, laser cutters were things of the enterprise. You know, they were things that took an engineering force to uh, create the files for, and that took a maintenance force to run, and specialized people to print something out with them, to produce something with them. Now, the PC makes these tools agile, easily used by um, individuals. One reason I focus on the subtractive digital fabrication is because it applies to such a wide range and wide scale of materials. I'm going to show you a picture of a, um, of a house. I'll show you the house in a second. This is plywood, plywood cut out of sheets just like on the table here on a tool exactly the size of that table. You can see the interesting thing about these parts is that they're very precisely machined. Every single one of them has a number, all sorts of interesting joints. This is a house designed by MIT architects that was assembled outside the Museum of Modern Art a couple summers ago, demonstrating new fabrication techniques in construction. Every single piece on this house that was put together was cut on this tool, a flatbed shop bot. Um, and fitted together much like a picture puzzle. Every piece was unique. And um, it went together without a single piece of mechanical fastening. Everything was friction fit and knocked together with mallets by a crew that knew nothing about construction. Uh, a remarkable house designed by the MIT architects with the idea that these houses would be used to help um, in uh, New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, what they illustrate to me is sort of the power of the digital fabrication, both additive and subtractive, in terms of being able to produce the component with a high degree of accuracy in relation to the, the design model. And the parts that I showed you, the intricately cut parts in the frame of the building, communicate the uh, point that was made earlier today about when you're making something with digital fabrication, there's no cost to complexity or very little. It's just as easy for a CNC tool or a 3D. I don't know if, uh, as it is to make something simple. It's just as easy to cut a curve as it is a straight line. And that means that we're able to embed the instructions for assembly into the parts themselves. On a large scale, we're kind of experimenting with what we're going to use in a small scale in nanotechnology. That is, we're learning how to make parts that are self-assembling based on what gets engineered into the part that's made possible because of the precision and the power of the digital fabrication. It's accessible and usable, and it's accessible and usable to individuals and small shops in a way that the technology never was before. Digital fabrication makes new kinds of production possible. And by that, I mean with these tools, anybody, small shops, small fabrication operations, can create products that are the products for everyday life, 
whether it's a snowboard, I'll show you a few others in a second, or the same CNC routers, CNC mills, are now good enough to produce products useful for advanced manufacturing. The same kind of tools Mark was talking about that everyone now has available to them in a tech shop. Items of daily life, whether it's uh, furniture, musical instruments, signs, travel trailers, all of these kinds of things can be made with subtractive digital fabrication tools, as can uh, metal components, uh, uh, advanced materials components, prototype components, and so on. It's all available at affordable prices on tools that just about anybody can use. And that creates opportunities for a whole new kind of manufacturing, a whole new kind of productivity. The third industrial revolution, maybe. But I don't like industrial because what this gets us away from is that huge industrial manufacturing operation and allows us to scale a new kind of uh, production and manufacturing that's much more distributed and much more friendly. Based on cloud web services and resources, the collaborative tools that the web now gives us, the reach and presence that a small entrepreneur or operation can have from the web, the long tail marketing uh, phenomena characteristic of the web, add the power of today's digital fabrication to it, and you have an opportunity for new kinds of uh, distributed production, new ways of making things, new kinds of creativity. We've tried to seed, that we, ShopBot, has tried to seed this with a new um, web community that we call 100kgarages.com. 100k garages, 100,000 garages comes from a question that Tom Brokaw asked uh, presidential candidates a few years ago to the effect of, how would you cure America's problems with a new Manhattan-style project or with the creativity and innovation of 100,000 garages distributed across the country. We like the image of 100,000 garages across the country. And that's the basis of the website. The website is a place where people who want to get something made, it could be a homemaker. It could be someone wanting to prototype a new um, energy product. It could be somebody wanting to manufacture uh, a run of coffee tables. They can come to 100K garages and find one of hundreds of fabbers, we call them, distributed across the US, in fact, the world, who have digital fabrication equipment, CNC tools, CNC mills, laser cutters, water jets, 3D printers, and identify one appropriate to um, their production needs. The, um, neat aspect about this is it allows you to find and source digital fabrication that's available to you locally. And because of the networking aspect of the system, the fact that not only are there fabricators available in the network, but there are designers, designers who provide stuff and designers who provide consulting and assistance, all available to you, um, allows this whole system to work uh, very efficiently and in a way that makes it competitive with more traditional ways of doing things. This is uh, Ann and Gary, architects and uh, furniture creators at the University of uh, uh, Kentucky. They were designers. They created a line of parametric furniture that people can um, interact with, stretch and shrink, and get their tables and chairs done the size they want, the shape they want, and things like that. Gary and Ann identified on the 100K Garage Network a local prototyper, a local fab shop that did their prototyping. They worked the products out, and they can now offer their products to anyone anywhere in the world and find a local fabber through 100K Garages interested and ready to uh, make their product for them. Because these garages distributed around the country are entrepreneurial in nature and quite driven, in the, the spirit of the people that are participating in them, it creates real opportunities for things to happen. Um, Jeffrey and Jillian are uh, Maker Faire favorites from San Francisco. They run a design fabrication shop that's part of 100K Garages. 
If you use their services, not only would they jump in and make the stuff for you, but they'd help you design it. They've done some really interesting things, including the uh, portable putt-putt golf courses you may have seen at the uh, maker fairs in years gone by, and many other things I can't think of right off the bat. Um, the other thing about this distributed manufacturing is it can make use of locally available materials, available because they're either grown or made there, or because um, they're uh, recycled there. Plastic recycling of uh, Iowa Falls has uh, digital fabrication equipment that they use to take recycled material from the community to make signs, park benches, picnic tables, so on and so forth. Distributed digital manufacturing makes a lot of sense from an uh, energy point of view, from a recycling point of view, um, and so forth. Here's uh, one of my favorite examples, who should be here, but he's not. Uh, Bill Young is a digital fabricator on the eastern shore of Virginia. Bill is in a county that's one of the most disadvantaged and poorest uh, in the country, and yet he's a leading digital fabricator in um, this um, agenda to sort of create new opportunities. His idea is that doing digital fabrication in the community not only creates opportunities for the techie types that make the thing work, but his operation is such that it begins to employ many others in the community as well, because the products need to be packed, they need to be handled, and so on and so forth. Uh, here's Bill's shop. He does uh, furniture, he does really creative structures. One thing you may have seen in Maker Faire's past, he and a couple colleagues created a uh, shelter. Uh, they refer to it as Shelter 2.0. It's gone to Haiti. It helped uh, versions of this shelter are used in Atlanta to help the homeless. And at the Maker Fair, it's used as a kiosk for one sort or another. It's all digitally fabricated, flat pack sh shipped in a container smaller than that table there, and, uh, and all very efficient. Not to mention it could be fabricated on site um, if you needed to. Bill also does really interesting and creative furniture that take advantage, and I'll give you this one example of how you can build the assembly technique right into the material. These are table legs that you'll see at the maker store, at the maker fair. There are like 30 or 40 of them. And um, they go together with an interlocking dovetail joint that you could only cut, you could only make if you had a digital fabrication tool. And um, the ability to do that creates the opportunity to make all sorts of new, uh, new furnishing. So to finish, I would just say there, uh, because of digital fabrication, are now, new, uh, are now opportunities for new kinds of manufacturing, manufacturing done in a distributed way and based on the energy and enthusiasm of the kind of entrepreneurial community that has gotten excited about hands-on making and digital fabrication.